Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the human papillomavirus entry mechanism. Okay, so we've now been over the basic histology of squamous stratified epithelia, and we've in particular seen that there are two different types of squamous stratified epithelia, keratinized and non-keratinized. For keratinized, the major example, of course, is the epidermis. For non-keratinized, we've been for a whole long list of examples, but importantly, it includes the ectocervix, the epithelium that covers the ectocervix. Right, uh, we then went on to the fact that there are many different types of human papillomaviruses, over 120 are currently known, and that we can split these into two broad categories, the ones that infect keratinized squamous stratified epithelium, which we call the cutaneous HPVs, and those which infect the non-keratinized squamous stratified epithelium. And since non-keratinized squamous stratified epithelium is also called mucosal squamous stratified epithelium, we call these the mucosal HPVs. So the next topic that I want to talk about is the structure of human papillomaviruses. And the structure is going to be pretty much the same, at least to our basic account, for all the different 120 types uh, or more of human papillomaviruses. So what I'm about to say about the structure of these viruses goes for all the different types of human papillomavirus. Okay, so remember back to basic virus structure. You have the genome at the centre of the virus particle and then a proteinaceous uh, protection shell around that known as the capsid. And around many capsids you then have an envelope. Now, um, influenza virus, human immunodeficiency virus, these two infamous viruses that cause disease in humans, these have an envelope, and this phospholipid bilayer around the capsid, called the envelope, is stolen from the host cell. It comes from the host cell membrane. Human papillomaviruses do not have an envelope, so that's one of the first things to write down here. Whoops, I need the pen. So, human papillomaviruses, they are non enveloped viruses. They do not have a viral envelope. They do not have a phospholipid bilayer around their capsid. Okay, next what we want to discuss then is the capsid, which is the outer layer of the virus particle. So we'll work inwards. So the outermost layer of the virus particle, we do not have an envelope. So the outermost layer is the capsid. And the capsid is made out of two proteins, which are given the rather exciting names L1 and L2. Now, you have a lot more L1 in the capsid than you have L2, and therefore L1 is also called the major capsid protein, and L2 is called the minor capsid protein. So let me firstly describe L1's role in the capsid, and then we'll come on to L2. Both of these, by the way, are important, so don't think that L1 is more important than L2. They both are important. Without both of them, you don't get successful, complete entry of the human papillomavirus particle. However, as we will see, um, you if you don't have L2, you get you know, you get far along the process, it just it just doesn't finish. L2 is only needed right at the very end of the entry mechanism. However, we'll see this as the video goes on. For now, let's just talk about the structure of this. So let's start with L1 here. So L1. So L1, to make a human papillomavirus capsid, you need 360 copies of the L1 protein, and these are assembled into pentamers. So let me get a more exciting colour. We'll have red for a moment. Okay, so these 360 copies of the protein, you need to build me 360 copies of the L1 protein, and then I will assemble them into pentamers. Now, pentamer just means a five-membered structure. So let's just draw a pentagon here like so, and the pentamers are going to look roughly like this picture that I'm drawing here. So here we have five components, one, two, three, four, five. Those are the L1 proteins, so we assemble these pentamers, and you'll notice I have taken care to show a tube down the middle, a central cavity in the L1 pentamers, and that is going to become significant because that's where the L2 proteins can sit. So I haven't just done that by accident. 
Okay, so a little bit of mental arithmetic for you now. If I start off with 360 L1 proteins and I assemble them all into pentamers, how many pentamers will I end up with? Well, you divide 360 by 5, and the simple way of doing that is dividing it by 10 and then times it by 2. So divide it by 10, we get 36. Times it by 2, we get 72. So you're going to end up with 72 pentamers of L1. And these are the major thing that make up the capsid. So now, drawing a picture of this then, let's say this is our viral particle, and this outer shell, the capsid, is constructed out of the L1 pentamers. So here is an L1 pentamer, here's another L1 pentamer, another L1 pentamer, etc. It's the surface of a sphere made out of these L1 pentamers all joined together, 72 L1 pentamers all joined together make up the surface of this sphere that is the viral capsid. So just to hammer this point home, this is hollow, this is just a shell, an outer um, proteinaceous shell, which we call the viral capsid, and it's constructed out of 72 pentamers of this major capsid protein, L1. So you've got the message, L1 is extremely important. L2, you do not need L2 to build a capsid, you do need L2 to build a successful human papillomavirus. This functions as a shell on its own, however, the virus doesn't complete the entry mechanism without L2 proteins, at least some L2 proteins, so you do need some L2 proteins. So let's now talk about where the L2 proteins go. So the L2 proteins can insert in this canal here, and I just want to draw an L1 pentamer from a different angle. So I'm now going to imagine that I'm standing on the side of this and looking at it from the side. So I'm just drawing this in here. Okay, so I'm now effectively drawing a three-dimensional picture of it rather than previously we've just had a two-dimensional picture. So there's the canal through the middle, and here are the five L1 proteins. So just drawing this from the side so we've got a 3D picture. And you've got this central canal through the middle of the L1 pentamer, and this is where the L2 protein can sit. So I'm now colouring in the L2 protein in green. So it'll go right the way through, and then it'll have a bit on the inside. So most of the L2 protein is actually located on the inside of the capsid, uh, but it does have a bit that goes through the tunnel and then a bit that will be exposed on the outer surface of the virus. So in principle, how many L2 proteins can you have in a single viral capsid? Well, this isn't difficult. Each one of them has to go in the middle of a L1 pentamer, we have 72 L1 pentamers, so in principle you could have 72 L2 proteins in a viral capsid. In reality you don't usually have 72, it's usually much less than 72, it's usually around 10 or uh, higher, a little bit higher than that. 8, 10, 12, you know, different papers quote different numbers as the normal number of L2, but the point is it could, in theory, go up to 72, it could not go higher than 72. So that's that's why I've put less than or equal to 72. So, to build the capsid then of a human papillomavirus particle, uh, what you do is you take 360L1 um, molecules, you pentamerize them together, okay, you assemble them into the surface of a sphere like this, and onto some of them you insert L2 proteins in this way. So just to complete up the picture then, some of these are going to have L2 proteins, but not all of them. So most human papillomavirus particles will not have uh, 72 L2 particles, you'll have much fewer. So it'll look more like what I've shown here with just those five that I've shown there having L2 proteins on this side of the viral capsule that we're seeing. Okay, so that's the capsid. We're almost complete on our discussion of the structure of the virus because it really is an extremely simple virus. I mean, viruses are always simple. They're very simple uh, structures to study in biology, far simpler than human cells or indeed a whole human, um, which is why, you know, they are actually comprehensible by the human mind. And human papillomavirus is a specifically uh, simple example because it doesn't have the envelope that makes HIV and influenza virus so much more complicated to study. So inside the capsid then you just have the genome. So let's imagine we've cut through our viral capsid now and we'll just represent the viral capsid now by this 
uh, red annulus here. So this is a cross-sectional view now. And then inside the interior of the capsid, you'll then have the genome. And I'll put the genome here in blue. So this is what we could call the vDNA for short. This is a nice abbreviation. That just stands for viral DNA or we could call it in full the viral genome. Now, how long is the viral genome? Well, it's 8,000 bases long, so eight kilobases uh, long. So it's not actually that long at all. 8,000 uh, base pairs is how long this is. And as you can see from what I've drawn there, it's a circular genome. So it's not linear, it's a little circle of DNA. And that's a very small circle of DNA. So this is really, you know, getting to the point that the human mind can understand this. This is all these things are. Uh, a capsid like so, and then this viral genome of eight kilobases long. To complicate the matter, just to add a little complexity in here that is unfortunately true, it just makes it a little bit more complicated. The viral genome does have some histone proteins um, associated with it. It's wrapped around a few histone proteins. So if I was to draw a more accurate picture, it might look something like this. Ooh, the pen's not working. Ah, here we go. So it might look something like this. I'm drawing the DNA wrapped around histone proteins here. Drawing it badly wrapped around histone proteins. Remember, DNA, when it wraps around histone proteins, it goes around twice. Oops. And getting confused for making it go around twice. So the point is that each of these, there will be a histone complex there. So I'll draw them in red like so. So these are the histone complexes with the DNA uh, wrapped around it. So in reality, the viral genome would look a little bit more like this. Um, but to keep things simple, let's have this simple picture here. So these histones, you might be wondering where they came from. They, again, were nicked from the host cell. So they're not something that's coded for by the viral genome. The viral genome is incredibly simple. It's 8,000 bases. It only has eight genes on it, and that does not include genes for histone proteins. So it relies on the host cell giving it a few histone proteins to wrap its genome around. Okay, so that is the structure of human papillomaviruses, and this is true for all the different types of human papillomaviruses. Yes, for the different types, they will have slightly different genomes, slightly different genes coding for the L1 and L2 proteins, and therefore the L1 and L2 proteins will have slightly different combinations of amino acids. So if you look at the primary structure of the L1 proteins between the different types of human papillomavirus, you will find discrepancies. However, overall, they still perform the same role, so... Uh, to keep this simple, we can have this picture for all our different human papillomavirus types. Okay, so uh, there's the structure of human papillomaviruses. We are now ready to begin with the entry mechanism. So where do I want to go for this? It might be good, actually, to start over here. So we are now going to discuss the actual entry mechanism. We've done all the background stuff now. Uh, we understand the structure of HPVs, we understand the tissues that they're going to infect. Now remember, human papillomaviruses, when they infect a squamous stratified epithelium, they always have to infect the basal cell layer. They cannot infect the more superficial layers. This means that a microabrasion usually has to occur in order for human papillomaviruses to gain access to the basal cells. Because if the epithelium is perfectly intact, then how on earth would a human papillomavirus out in the environment uh, actually get to the basal cells? So the first thing that has to occur is a microabrasion usually to the squamous stratified epithelium. And of course, if we're dealing with a cutaneous HPV, then the squamous stratified epithelium that we'll be dealing with will be the epidermis. If we're dealing with a mucosal HPV, it'll be one of the mucosal squamous stratified epithelia. However, the entry mechanism we believe is the same, so we can generalise it now. We can just refer to a basal cell. Okay, so what has to occur then is a microabrasion so that you have the basement membrane exposed and then you've got the basal cells next to this portion that the microabrasion has occurred on, and of course then the virus will be able to gain access to those basal cells. So I think I'll just draw a fresh picture here, starting again with the basement membrane. So here, this is the basement membrane, and now I'm going to draw the basal cell much bigger than previously. 
Um, let me choose my pen size. I'll do it in a larger pen so it shows up better. So here, this is going to be my basal cell that's now going to be exposed because it's next to this portion of um, epithelium that has had the microabrasion occur. So let's say the microabrasion has occurred here. So now this portion is exposed and here is this basal cell next to the microabrasion. Of course, there would still be cells above it. So it would have mid zone cells up here and superficial cells up here. But to keep the picture simple, let's just draw our basal cell here. Okay, so uh, let's now um, discuss how this is going to occur. What's the pathway then? So let's put on our human papillomavirus. So we'll have the bad guy in, in evil red here. So here comes the human papillomavirus, which I'll just draw. That's the capsid. And here, this can represent the genome. So this is the human papillomavirus, HPV, up here. And this, of course, over in white here, the shining good guy, uh, this is the basal cell. Right, uh, so how does the entry occur? So we now understand how the human papillomavirus can actually get exposed to the basal cell. The first thing that has to happen is it has to bind to the basal cell. Now, we do not think it initially binds directly to the basal cell. We think that what actually happens is it first binds to the basement membrane and then it gets transferred onto the basal cell. Just because the basement membrane has so many more, you know, it's so much more likely that when this HPV enters this wound that it's going to hit the basement membrane first rather than hitting the basal cell. And indeed, it might be the case that the human papillomavirus is transferred onto the basal cell as the microabrasion uh, is healing. So remember, imagine if this human papillomavirus bounds down here on the basement membrane, and I'm actually just going to draw this in. So let's say it binds down here. So we think the first step is binding to the basement membrane, and I might just actually put that in. So this is step one, binding. And it's specifically, we think, binding to the basement membrane firstly. Now, it could bind initially to the basal cell, and you'll understand what I mean in a moment when we've discussed what we think it is that this is binding to. And actually, before I go any further, I should probably do a speech here. The entry mechanism for human papillomaviruses is still controversial, so what I am telling you in this video is our best current model for how human papillomaviruses enter the basal cells. It will evolve in the future. All of science is just models, models to help us understand the reality that we live in. Okay, so uh, take everything I say with a pinch of salt. It is at present what I believe to be the best model of HPV entry, but it may well uh, change in 20 years time or whatever. Okay, uh, so speech over. So the first step we believe is that it's going to bind to the basement membrane. As I say, we think this is just probabilistic. It could bind directly to the basal cell initially, and you'll see more in a moment when I've explained what we think it's binding to, because actually the thing we think it's binding to is equally present in the basement membrane and on the basal cell membranes. Uh, but just from probability, we think it probably hits the basement membrane first, binds there, and then when the repair is occurring, Remember, basal cells divide and produce two basal cells so that you repopulate this basal cell there. That means you're going to get a basal cell coming on top of this portion of basement membrane where the HPV is, and that will mean that this HPV can then just quite simply transfer onto uh, the basal cell. Okay, so the question now becomes, um, what is it binding to? What is the initial binding receptor. So this is what we call the primary receptor for HPVs. So uh, let's put this up here. So the initial binding is going to be to the primary receptor and it's going to be L1 that is going to mediate this binding. And in fact, here is an important point, L2. We will talk about L2 throughout the video. However, 
L2 is not actually essential for the first part of the entry mechanism whatsoever. It only becomes important right at the end. And this is demonstrated by the fact that in labs we can create HPV uh, virus-like particles that don't have the L2 protein. So we can create these L1 capsids without uh, the L2 protein in. We can put DNA inside them and we can see um, how far along the entry pathway do these structures actually get. And they get quite far along. They certainly bind to the primary receptor and they do actually get inside the cells, but they don't um, traffic through the endocytic pathway in the same way unless they have the L2 protein. So L2 only becomes important right at the end of our story. So bear that in mind. Everything in the first part of the story is all going to be about L1. Okay, so the primary receptor is going to be something that can bind to L1. So I'll just put that in. So the primary receptor L1 binds to this. And this is something that is actually present in both the basement membrane and also on the surface of the basal cells. And we believe, and you know, this is something that we have quite a lot of confidence in. Parts of this mechanism we're less confident about, we know less about than this bit. We do have quite a lot of confidence in what the primary receptor is. We believe the primary receptor is heparan sulfate proteoglycans. And I am going to spend now a lot of time going over some biochemistry to make sure that you understand what a heparan sulfate proteoglycan is. So for short, heparan sulfate proteoglycans are abbreviated to HSPGs. In the full, this is what the name is, heparan sulfate, and then the PGs is for proteoglycans. So, this is going to take, as I say, quite a bit of explaining because I want to do this properly. So I'm firstly going to tell you about what heparan sulfate is and then we'll come back and explain it properly. What is a heparan sulfate proteoglycan? So firstly, let's just talk about what is heparan sulfate. So heparan sulfate is an example of a polysaccharide, a carbohydrate molecule that comes under the category of glycosaminoglycans. And there is an old name for glycosaminoglycans. They're also called mucopolysaccharides. So this is a category of carbohydrate molecules, and not all carbohydrates that are important in biology come under this category. So this is a category, a classification, or a class of carbohydrate molecules and a lot of important examples of carbohydrate molecules that are involved structurally in biology uh, are glycosaminoglycans. And for short, glycosaminoglycans is often abbreviated down to GAGs. Heparan sulfate is an example of a glycosaminoglycan. Now, something very important to say right at the start is that it is not the same thing as heparin. Heparin is another example of a glycosaminoglycan. It's very similar to heparan sulfate, but they are not the same thing. So heparan sulfate is not the same as heparin. People often think, oh, has someone just misspelt uh, heparin here? Do they mean heparin? And unfortunately, some people often misspell heparan and put heparin sulfate. That is incorrect. There is heparin and there are hep is heparan sulfate. These are not the same things. Okay, so do not confuse heparan sulfate and heparin. Right, so that's the first thing to say. Now let's talk about what a glycosaminoglycan actually is. And by the way, heparin is another example of a glycosaminoglycan. Both of these are glycosaminoglycans. We're not going to discuss heparin any further. We're just going to discuss heparan sulfate. So what is a glycosaminoglycan then? Well, they're polysaccharides, which means they're going to be polymers of monosaccharides. Now, the specific characteristic feature of a glycosaminoglycan is that it's going to be a polymer of a disaccharide combination. And this disaccharide combination is that you need a uronic acid sugar bound to an amino sugar. So a uronic acid with an amino sugar. 
So to create a glycosaminoglycan, you have to create loads of disaccharides that are like this. So you create loads of disaccharides, which are a combination of a uronic acid with an amino sugar, and then you polymerize them together. So it goes uronic acid, amino sugar, uronic acid, amino sugar, uronic acid, amino sugar, and on and on it goes. That is what a glycosaminoglycan is. Now, the disaccharide do not need to be repeated over and over again. So you can select for your first one a certain uronic acid and then a certain amino sugar. It does not have to be the same uronic acid and the same amino sugar in the next disaccharide along. Glycosaminoglycans just have the property that they alternate between having a uronic acid and an amino sugar. That is what these molecules are. They are great big polysaccharides where you alternate between having a uronic acid and an amino sugar, a uronic acid and an amino sugar. And as we'll discuss later on, you can have modifications, varying levels of modification to the uronic acid and the amino sugar, sulfonation and also um, acetylation, but we'll discuss that much later. Now, the different types of glycosaminoglycans will contain different percentages of uronic acids, of certain uronic acids and certain amino sugars. And we'll talk in a moment, once I've gone through examples of uronic acid sugars and amino acid sugars, um, what the specific combination is for heparan sulfate, what characterizes heparan sulfate compared to different glycosaminoglycans. So, for now, let me do some examples of uronic acid sugars and amino sugars. So we'll begin with uronic acid sugars, and this is where we're going to go into deep biochemistry. Well, not particularly deep, but biochemistry. More biochemistry than you might be comfortable with, but bear with it, it's all important. So, uronic acid, there are two important uronic acid sugars, and they are glucuronic acid, and these, by the way, are all monosaccharides. Uronic acid sugars are monosaccharides, and amino sugars are monosaccharides. So glucuronic acid is an example of a uronic acid sugar. And also the other one is iduronic acid, or iduronic acid. Okay, so these are the two examples of uronic acids. Now, I'm actually going to show you the structures of these monosaccharides just to convince you that they are monosaccharides. Uh, and you'll also, from seeing the structure, see how actually glucuronic acid is not actually all that different from iduronic acid. It's incredibly unsatisfactory. It turns out that actually these two molecules are just optical isomers of one another. So let's see this. So we'll start by drawing the structure of glucuronic acid. So they're all six-membered ring polysaccharides with six carbons. So let me draw this. So I'm drawing skeletal structures, so we won't show carbons. They'll be shown by corners, and we won't show hydrogens attached to carbons. So there is an oxygen atom up there. And then the other five members of this six-membered ring are all carbon atoms. So here's the six-membered ring. And now we're going to have groups coming off the sides of these carbons, apart from just hydrogens. Now up on this carbon, carbon number five, so the way it's numbered is this one's one, this one's two, this one's three, this one's four, this one's five. I'm sure you've seen monosaccharide structures before. Now, off carbon number five, we're going to have carbon number six coming, and in a uronic acid sugar, carbon number six is going to be a carboxylic acid. That's what class of, what you know characterizes these uronic acid sugars. They have a carboxylic acid group. So here we go. The important thing that we have to now note is that there are different ways, optical arrangements, for the groups to come off. So this carbon here is going to have two groups coming off it. One's going to be a carboxylic acid group and one's going to be a hydrogen. Now either the hydrogen can go into the board away and the carboxylic acid can come out towards us, or it can be the other way around. There are two optical arrangements here. Imagine that the oxygen, the car this carbon and this carbon are all in the plane of the board as I've drawn. If we were thinking about the 3D structure of this, the two other groups aren't, well, they're going to come, one's going to go off at this sort of angle into the board, and one's going to come off at this sort of angle out of the board. And, you know, which group goes in which way? And 
it, it is significant. You might say, well, who cares? But you can't change it around without performing a chemical reaction, without breaking both of the bonds and then swapping them around. You can't change it around. So they are fundamentally different molecules in three-dimensional space, even though uh, if you just drew a two-dimensional diagram of them it, and you didn't put effort in to try and um, show it three-dimensionally, um, you might not realise um, that they were different molecules, but it is significant. So let me draw this here. So the carboxylic acid grouping, glucuronic acid, is going to come out of the page towards us. And the way that I show that is by having an arrow, well, having a line that gets thicker like so. So this is a carboxylic acid group. Now the other group that goes into the page away from us is just a hydrogen, so we don't need to show that. Okay, next, coming to Carbon number four, and let me just finish up the numbering of the carbons now. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so coming on to carbon number four, what groups does it have coming off? An alcohol group and a hydrogen. So the question now is which one goes into the page away from us and which one comes out of the page towards us? So imagine that this ring is in the plane of the piece of paper or the board. Um, then for each of these carbons, the same question arises, i.e. the two groups that are coming off, which direction do they go, well, how are you going to orient it, which optical isomer are you going to pick? Um, so the important group, the alcohol group, is actually going to go into the page away from us, like so in glucuronic acid. Then, uh, coming down to the third carbon here again, you have an alcohol group and a hydrogen, and speeding up a little bit, the alcohol group is going to come out of the page towards us, and the hydrogen will go into the page away from us. Carbon two again, you have an alcohol group and a hydrogen, the alcohol goes into the page away from us, and I show into the page away from us just to spell this out uh, with um, these dashed lines, that's what that means. And then finally, the carbon in position number one is going to come out of the page towards us, like so. So this structure that I have drawn for you here, this is what people mean when they say glucuronic acid, this molecule. However, now it gets slightly more complicated, and I am actually going to do this slightly more complicated story, because what we've done so far is a little bit too simple. This is the molecule that people mean when they say glucuronic acid generally. However, if you're being strict, there are actually four different types of glucuronic acid that are all optical isomers of one another, and the structure that I have strictly drawn for you is what you would call beta D glucuronic acid, rather than just glucuronic acid. However, this is strict biochemistry rules now. In reality, this is the most common form of glucuronic acid, and therefore people don't bother putting the fact that they mean beta-D glucuronic acid. They just say glucuronic acid, and they assume that you know that they mean beta-D glucuronic acid, that they wouldn't be talking about one of the other three forms of glucuronic acid, because who cares about those other forms of glucuronic acid? They're nowhere near as important in biology. However, I want to do things properly, so I'm now going to tell you about the different forms of glucuronic acid. So we've got two labels here. So one of the labels is the beta, and one of the labels is the D. Now, you can have alpha or beta forms of glucuronic acid, and you can have L and D forms of glucuronic acid. That means that the four different forms of glucuronic acid are alpha D glucuronic acid, beta D glucuronic acid, which is the one I've got drawn here, alpha L glucuronic acid and beta L glucuronic acid, okay? Now let me tell you how the structures actually differ. So this is beta D glucuronic acid. Let me now tell you about what alpha D glucuronic acid looks like. So alpha D glucuronic acid has this uh, alcohol group on carbon number one going in the opposite direction, going into the page. So let me try and color code this in. So if we wanted alpha D glucuronic acid, what you would do is you'd have the alcohol group going into the page here and the hydrogen then coming out of the page. And 
alpha-D-glucuronic acid and beta-D-glucuronic acid are described as specific types of optical isomers to one another. They are called anomers of one another, and this is a word that you just use in carbohydrate chemistry, um, because this carbon here, of the carbohydrate molecule, this is known as the anomeric carbon, okay? And for this anomeric carbon, you can have the side groups oriented in the two possible ways, and this gives rise to the two different anomers of the molecule. So alpha-D-glucuronic acid, where the alcohol is going into the page, and beta-D-glucuronic acid, where the alcohol is coming out of the page, um, those are anomers of one another. Now, you might think that deciding whether a molecule is alpha or beta all you need to do is ask, does the alcohol group come out of the page or go into the page? If it goes into the page, then it's alpha, or if it comes out of the page, it's beta. But that's not actually the rule. In the case of this one, it works that way. However, the rule is actually that you need to look at the fact, is it going the same way as the sixth carbon group coming off the fifth carbon? So if the group, the major group, which is the alcohol here, goes the same way as the sixth carbon, in, in the case of the beta anima, they did, then it's beta. Whereas if they're going in opposite directions, if the alcohol group goes into the page and the sixth carbon comes out of the page, then it's called uh, alpha, the alpha anima. So that's the actual rule for deciding whether we're talking about the alpha or beta anima. You look at whether it's coming the same way as the carbon, uh, the sixth carbon. Okay, you'll get the hang of this. We're going to go through lots of other structures, so you'll get used to it. Okay, if you haven't seen this before. Now, uh, let's talk about L-glucuronic acid. So, L-glucuronic acid versus D-glucuronic acid is the enantiomer. So, L is different. It's not an anima. It's an enantiomer. Now, remember back to organic chemistry. What is meant by an enantiomer? This is a special type of optical isomer, and this is a word that's used outside of just biochemistry. Anima, you can only use this in biochemistry, specifically carbohydrate chemistry. Enantiomer is a word that's much more general. This is a word from, you know, proper chemistry. Now, enantiomer refers to molecules that are mirror images of one another. So beta-D-glucuronic acid and beta-L-glucuronic acid are going to be mirror images of one another. Now, how would you get the mirror image of this molecule? Now, this requires you to have a little bit of visualisation here. And I advise you to think about this for yourself, because it is a difficult thing. But once you've visualised it in your head, you will understand why this works. All you need to do to get the mirror image of this molecule is just reverse the orientation of every single one of the groups. Imagine putting this in a mirror. Imagine that there's a mirror in front of this molecule. Um, so a mirror out of the plane in front of the molecule. And then what would the mirror image molecule actually look like? Well, of course, this ring would be in exactly the same position, but all of these groups would be going in the opposite orientation because this one coming out of the page, that would be coming towards the mirror, and therefore the mirror image in the mirror here would have to be going out back towards the plane of the whiteboard here, uh, if you know what I mean. It might help if I actually do draw this, I will. So let me now draw beta L glucuronic acid. Whoops, already made a mistake. Missed out the oxygen. Okay, so this, I hope I can convince you, is the mirror image of the beta D glucuronic acid that I've drawn there. So again, I'll spell it out. Imagine there is a mirror in front of the board that is going to reflect this. So you would still end up with the six-membered ring exactly where it was, but now the carboxylic acid group will have to go into the page away from us, uh, this alcohol group here will have to come out of the page towards us. Uh, this one will have to go into the page away from us. So I'm just inverting all of these groups, and this will end up being the mirror image of the other one, like so. This one will have to come out of the page towards us, and then if we're talking about beta-D-glucuronic acid, this one will now have to go into the page away from us. So this molecule that I've just drawn here, this is beta l glucuronic acid. Okay, and let's just revise 
the beta and the alpha animas. Why is this the beta anima? You might have, if you had thought that the definition of the alpha and beta animas was to do with whether this group was going into or out of the page, you might have wanted to label this up alpha L glucuronic acid, but you would have been incorrect. This is beta L glucuronic acid because this alcohol group is going the same way as the sick carbon. So remember the proper definition of alpha and beta. Same side, beta, opposite sides, alpha. Okay, so this is beta L glucuronic acid, the mirror image of beta D glucuronic acid. And then if you wanted alpha L glucuronic acid, all you'd have to do is switch this around to get the anima, have the alcohol group now coming out of the page towards us. So there's a bit of biochemistry for you, a bit of naming up of these monosaccharides. So these are all the four different forms of glucuronic acid. These are all glucuronic acid molecules. However, the beta D glucuronic acid molecule is by far the most important one. This is the one that is most prevalent in biology. And therefore, when people just say glucuronic acid and they do not clarify which one they mean, they mean you can take it as they mean beta D glucuronic acid. And therefore, this is the structure above all the others to learn this structure here ignore the red bit this structure here so from now on I will just be talking about glucuronic acid and I will mean beta D uh, glucuronic acid but I'm glad that I've taught you a bit of biochemistry background here okay so now let's talk about iduronic acid or iduronic acid so let's do the structure of this and I want to find some new interesting color we'll have uh, a marine blue sort of colour. Okay, so I'll do this uh, down here, I think. So again, hydronic acid is incredibly similar structure to glucuronic acid, and this is the reason I wanted to go through all of these different uh, forms of glucuronic acid, so that you really have a good understanding of which molecules are glucuronic acid and which molecules are hydronic acid, and how the two are different. Okay, uh, so again, we're going to have the six-membered ring here, and again, the sixth carbon is going to be a carboxylic acid group, but this time the carboxylic acid group is going to go into the page away from us, like so. Okay, oh, and I missed something off when I was talking about how you decide which enantiomer of glucuronic acid is going to be the D and the L one. So I told you about how we decide which one's alpha and which one's beta, but I didn't tell you about how we decide which one of these is going to be L and which one's going to be D. So the one with the carboxylic acid group coming out of the page towards us is always called D, and the one, sorry, not just carboxylic acid group, the one with the sixth carbon coming out of the page towards us is going to be D, because this is applied for more than just uronic acid sugars. And the one with the sixth carbon going into the page away from us is called L. So the L and D definition, they're enantiomers of one another, and the way that you decide the naming actually is just on whether it's coming out of the page towards us or into the page away from us, whereas alpha and beta, it's more, common, it, uh, more complicated. It's to do with um, uh, is the anomeric alcohol group going the same way as the sixth carbon, which determines the naming of the L and D, or is it going the opposite way, alpha? Okay, uh, so back to hydronic acid. So again, hydronic acid, there's a major form of it, but there are again actually four different forms, and the naming works exactly the same way. You'll be relieved to here. Once you've learned this complicated naming system, it works for all of them. Okay, so that's the good news here. So, now putting the other ones on here, off the fourth carbon, the alcohol group goes into the page away from us, and then everything's the same as in beta D glucuronic acid now. So, off the uh, third carbon here, the alcohol group comes out of the page towards us. Off the second one, the alcohol group goes into the page away from us, and then off this first one, the alcohol group comes out of the page towards us. Now, if I told you that, again, hydronic acid is exactly like glucuronic acid, it's exactly the same story. Strictly speaking, there are four forms of hydronic acid. This is the most common one, the most important biologically, and this is someone just says hydronic acid is what they mean. However, if we wanted to give this its proper name, what would you suspect it would be from how I've educated you now? Using the example of glucuronic acid, can you come up with the proper name for this? Pause the video and see if you can. So here's the answer. 
So, it's going to again have the LD naming, and they're going to be an antimers of one another. So if you took the mirror image of this, it would be in an antimer. Which one's going to be L and which one's going to be D? Is this one going to be L or is this one going to be D? It's going to be L because the sixth carbon is going into the page away from us. So this is L, hydronic acid, and then we have to decide, is it alpha or is it beta? Well, the anomeric alcohol group, the alcohol group coming off the anomeric carbon here, is it going into the page away from, uh, uh, sorry, is it going the same way as the sixth carbon or the opposite way to the sixth carbon? It's going the opposite way, so that means this is alpha L, hydronic acid. So, in utter contrast to the most common form of glucuronic acid, which is beta D, the most common form of hydronic acid is alpha L hydronic acid. But you will notice that these two molecules, alpha L hydronic acid and beta D glucuronic acid, which are the two most common forms of hydronic acid and glucuronic acid respectively, they're actually only different by optical isomerism in one carbon, effectively. And there is another fancy name. We've had anima and antima. There's another n word that you can use for this. Epima means optical isomer that only differs in the orientation of the groups coming off one carbon. And again, you can only apply this for carbohydrate chemistry, really. So these molecules are epimers of one another because they only differ from one another because of the orientation of the groups on one of the carbons. So they're very similar optically to one another. Okay, but again, there are four forms of hydronic acid. If we wanted beta L hydronic acid, we'd have to turn this alcohol group to going into the page away from us. If we wanted alpha D hydronic acid, we'd have to take the mirror image of this. We'd have to reverse every single one of these around. And then if we wanted um, beta D hydronic acid, we'd have to reverse everything around again, and then we'd have to have this one going the same way as the carboxylic acid group, and now the carboxylic acid group would be coming out of the page towards us, so this would have to go um, in out of the page towards us as well. So we'd swap everything around except this one, actually. Okay, so that is hydronic acid. So these are the two major examples of a uronic acid sugar. Glucuronic acid, strictly speaking, I mean beta D glucuronic acid, and iduronic acid, strictly speaking, I mean alpha L iduronic acid. Okay, so in this position, then you can have this molecule or this molecule. So we've done the strict bit now. Now I'm going to do what everyone does and just refer to beta D glucuronic acid as glucuronic acid and alpha L iduronic acid as iduronic acid. So in this position we can have glucuronic acid or iduronic acid molecules. So that's the uronic acid molecules. We will have a break here because we've been going for 45 minutes now. In the next video, I will now tell you about the amino sugars that you can have here, glucosamine and galactosamine. And then I'll tell you about the fact that we can acetylate and sulfonate these monosaccharides in this polysaccharide. And then I'll tell you about heparan sulfate, this specific example of a glycosamino glycan. Okay, so see you in the next video.